Hello, I'm back. Make me Hello. a post and we're going to start. Yep, I have started now just to let people um, come in. Great. Hello. Fantastic. So let me, no, still not working. So we're just going to keep going. No worries. We'll give it uh, 20 seconds or so and just um, in case a few more want to come in. Of course. Um, we might start um, and then if any more trickle in as we go. Um, so I just want to say hello to everyone and welcome and thank you for joining tonight. I'm Jackie Henwood, the Research Project Manager at CIRA, the Centre Fire Research Australia. I'd like again to thank you for joining to listen to discuss the ethical and medico-legal challenges of artificial intelligence in health. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we connect tonight via our computers and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So this is the 15th workshop, which is part of a series discussing artificial intelligence in healthcare from data to algorithm to real world solutions. These workshops are supported by the Medical Research Future Fund and our goal is to connect the diverse skills of clinicians, researchers and healthcare workers with computer and AI scientists. Therefore, we're trying to get everyone working together to develop and build artificial intelligence solutions for real world healthcare challenges. So tonight we're very lucky to have Professor Owen Lowe with us. Um, so there will be a question and answer session at the end. So if you have any questions, pop them in the box. Um, Professor Owen Lowe is National Chief Medical Officer and Group General Manager of, of Clinical Governance for St. Vincent's Health Australia the nation's largest not-for-profit health and aged care provider with six public hospitals, 10 private hospitals and 23 aged care facilities. In his role as a group chief medical officer, he looks after patient experience at St. Vincent's Health, um, which implemented an exceptional experience strategy that has seen public and private hospitals lead the state and country with its patient experience survey scores. So without further ado, I will pass over to Professor Erwin Lowe. You're, sorry, you're muted. I am muted. So thank you for the kind introduction. And we're going to get right into it. Apologies for the uh, delay. I was, we were trying to work out how I can share sound, but it, it, I, for whatever reason, I may not be able to share the sound. I do have a couple of videos, but we will see. I think I may be able to figure out a way of doing it, but let's just see how it goes. So I'm just here to talk to you about ethical, the ethical and medical legal challenges of AI. My understanding is that all of you are practitioners working in the AI space. So I'm not going to, so I'm going to go through the background information quite quickly before I move into the ethics and the medical legal challenges. And then we can have a bit of a discussion at the end. Okay. So uh, like um, Jackie, I want to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today. For me at the moment, I'm actually in Sydney in a hotel room. Uh, it's the Gadigal people of the Yoruba Nation. I want to acknowledge that they have occupied and cared for this land over countless generations. And I want to celebrate the continuing contribution to the lives of its regions. If there are any First Nations person online, I want to acknowledge you as well. So thank you for that. Now, in my role, um, Jackie has explained how I am the um, Chief Medical Officer, and I am also the uh, Vice President of the Royal Australian College of Medical Administrators. And my role is looking after the professional governance of clinicians, including doctors. And this is a painting of uh, surgeons in the 17th century. At that time, the surgeons back then were not, are not like the surgeons that we have today, right? Today, surgeons have their own college of surgeons and they, they see themselves as specialist doctors. But back then, doctors did not want to touch people. The only doctors that were around were physicians. The College of Physicians is the oldest college in the world, in the UK. And physicians want, wanted to intellectualize think about conditions. They didn't want to touch people. So the people who were doing operations at the time were barbers. People would cut hair, shave people, um, uh, who then, do, and during battles and during wartime, they were the ones doing the amputations. Now, today, Surgeons will argue that, you know, they are doing things that physicians can't do. But back then, physicians were saying, you know, surgeons were below them. And so this is a demonstration of how 
medicine has changed over time and how the role of doctors has, has evolved. And, and this is why we're here today, to talk about you know, how AI is gonna be changing the role of doctors. So you know, I've, I've written different things in the MJA and the quarterly about the future of medicine. It's an interest of mine, right? In BMJ Leader, my review of AI medicine is the most cited article still for that journal. I looked at how uh, the medicine of the future is good, will impact the profession and impact the health system in general. My background is in psychiatry, so I have an interest in AI and about suicide prevention and the ethics of that. Um, AI and robotics, I co-authored a chapter, and then, you know, I've co-authored and co I'm a co-editor of a textbook of AI in medicine as well. So I do have an interest in AI, and uh, I am not just a doctor, I'm also a lawyer. I, um, I, I have done a law degree and have worked as a lawyer full-time for two years before coming back into medicine. So I do have an interest in the legal implications of, uh, of AI in health too. So I know this is Sarah, I know this is an you know, eye research, and I'm showing you a skin, but I'll be interested to see what people think of this mole. Is this mole a cancerous mole or is it a normal mole? What do people think? Uh, uh, can people do chat here? Or is it our Q&A? Uh, yeah, there's a chat box. There's a chat box. Can you use it? If you can see the chat box, if you think this is a, a, a melanoma instead of a mole, can you, can you say something? Can you post on the chat box? Can you do that? I just want to see how many of you are. Um, a lot of you might not be clinicians or maybe not. Benign, Ming saying that's benign. That's okay, very good. He's using the chat box. I don't, he's doing a Q&A. I don't think they can use chat box. What about this one? People, this is, is this a normal mole or is this cancer? Trying to make this interactive. I don't know if people can actually do anything about it. Okay, I'm just going to keep going, right? Now, the, the both of these are cancer. Okay, they're both melanomas. Now, if you look at this, the convoluted neural network, a human being actually picked this as cancer, and the human was right. The AI was wrong in, the, in A. Here, the human thought this was a mole, the AI thought it was melanoma, and the AI was right. Okay. I'm going to then I'm going to just, you know, normally the attendee chat is disabled, uh, Jackie. Normally, if this is more interactive and I was in front of you in person, we could have a chat about is this a mole, is this cancer, right? Mole, is this cancer? Is this mole, is this cancer? Is this mole, is this cancer? Same. Is this a mole, is this cancer? I've made it um, interact. Everyone can use it now. Oh, you opened really the chat? That's, that's very useful. Um, but let's not spend too much time on it. I'm just going to show you a whole series of moles or cancer. And then all, everything I've just shown you was, were moles. They were not melanoma. But you can see in the left column, humans thought these were on the left column were, were melanoma. And, and they were wrong. The AI was right. On the right-hand column, humans correctly identified these as moles, but the AI thought they were melanoma and the AI was wrong. Now, this is actually a series of images from this um, journal article, the European Journal of Cancer. In this uh, article recently published, the um, uh, AI was on par with dermatologists. What that means is that the AI got it 50, you know, has many times wrong as a human, but just as good as a human dermatologist. Okay. This is on par against 145 dermatologists, not just a couple, right? So this is a, you know, this is from a couple of years ago, but interesting that AI is not at that level. And I think everyone online is not surprised because this is about image recognition and, and you would expect a machine to be very good at that. And so we're here to talk about AI. People know uh, this person, Alan Turing, he defined AI as thinking machines. And uh, people know what this test is. What, what is this? Post in the chat, if you know what this is. What am I showing you here? There's if you were to see, if you were the evaluator, what are you trying to evaluate here? So this is, this is a Turing test, right? I think people know about the Turing test. It's the test is, uh, yeah, that's it, the Turing test. When, and it's when you cannot tell if the person behind the screen talking to you is an AI or a computer screen. And, uh, and I think for some of you who are old enough, I, I am old enough, I had a IBM XT and I had this ELISA program. Remember this ELISA program, right? This is when you can chat with this chatbot 
and it talks to you and it's pretending to be a human being. Now, very easily you know that this is a chatbot because this was written in 1966. Today's chatbots are obviously a lot more sophisticated, right? But, you know, this whole idea of a machine that can interact with you is not, not new. Now, I'm going to assume you can't hear that. Um, this is, this is, um, I could hear that. Can you hear it? Oh, amazing. It was, yeah. Oh, amazing. Okay. I'm going to stop it there, right? But so that was Google Duplex launched by um, the CEO of Google at the time, Sundar Pichai. This is about three years ago, probably. Some of you might have seen the video, actually. So that person on the other side, this is live, right? Sundar actually got Google Duplex to, air, to make an appointment on his behalf uh, with a person on the other end who did not know it was Google Duplex, right? And, and uh, this alarmed a lot of people when it was shown. Do you think that Google Duplex has passed the Turing test based on that uh, phone call? Again, if you were in the room, you would tell me yes or no. I mean, technically speaking, no, it hasn't because it hasn't been. Sub the other person actually didn't know. When this was, when this was presented and, and went gone live, in fact, some states in um, America put in laws to say that you cannot do this. You can't, that, so what they've done is um, if Google Duplex now calls somebody, it actually introduces itself as, hi, I'm an AI, I'm not real. You're, talk, you're not talking to a real person because people are really concerned that they know. But, but as, a, as, a, as a Ming saying, no, it hasn't passed the Turing test because a proper Turing test, you will really test it out really, really, you know, you're not going to just base it on just a phone call. It's a proper, proper test. So, but I think everyone agrees AI is now, um, def I mean, there is the ethical question. Do, do you, ethically, do we need to know if you're talking to a person or a robot? Putting that aside, we know that AI is now taking over blue collar work. Everyone online knows about that, right? You know, uh, making food, baristas, sex robots, we know about that. And so that was uh, me having dinner with my family. That was on my daughter's head. That was a robot serving food in a Korean restaurant near where I, where I live. Some of you have seen this. Again, not new. Okay, so robots and AI is being used for all sorts of things. Now, what about white collar type things? Now, AI is coming in as well. Share trading, obviously, um, you know, reporting, writing uh, code, writing articles, uh, art from AI, news presenting. And even, even on TikTok now, there are AI uh, influencers, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, I think you all know this. But how about, what about kind of professional white color groups, right? So lawyers, and I'm being one of them, they, you go to a legal conference now, there will be a section on, on AI because AI is now helping to do a lot of the research uh, because law is all about case law and legislation. AI is helping to kind of bring that all together. And in fact, there was a study a few years ago where the AI was just as good as a, as a judge in a human rights court when it looked at all the facts and then came with a judgment and it compared the AI's judgment to a human judgment, it was about the same. So AI is moving to the space of kind of being almost as good as a lawyer or a judge in kind of determining outcomes. Um, you know, uh, again, reviewing uh, non-disclosure agreements, uh, it's, it's beating lawyers now. So there's all the very procedural things, but we're now here talking about health and, 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 and doctors, and that's one of the challenges of AI with, with, with doctors. I know, 
you know, Watson, you know, it's, it's now in, it's, it deployed. There are issues obviously with Watson, but um, it's helping to uh, look at different oncology chemotherapy protocols and coming up with a recommendation that's helpful for oncologists because there's a lot of literature out there around cancer. But, you know, when it comes to things like looking at data, that's common sense. It's obviously going to be much better than human. And image recognition, though, I mean, some of you may have seen this. For human beings, if I'm going to ask you, what's a dog, what's a cat, you'd kind of know because you've been brought up understanding the difference between dogs and cats. But for AI, it might be harder for them, for an AI to figure out in that picture, is that a dog or a cat? Um, and you can learn the differences. But then when you pick, when you send them lots and lots of photos, it kind of needs to learn even more. For us, looking at the photos, you kind of know. But even for some of us, it might be a bit hard, actually, with the dog and the mop on the right side. But most of the time, I think we can pick it. Um, but with image, with the sophistication of image recognition, I'll show you the, the, the terminologist study uh, in, in 2017, um, AI was beating 21 um, dermatologists. Then in 2018, it was beating 58. And then the study that I showed you was uh, 2019, 157. Uh, this is what uh, your research is around. I mean, this is, there's already AI apps looking at retina now. So, you know, I don't need to tell you this, that many, many, many different types of apps now and AI readings looking at the retina and predicting all sorts of diseases out of that. Uh, radiology is a big, big one. I think uh, and pathology, those are the two specialties, including ophthalmology and dermatology now, because the re image recognition that AI is supporting and potentially replacing a lot of what um, those specialties do, right? So I don't need to tell you this. This is our, this is, you kind of know all this. So uh, the challenge here is um, with image recognition, I'm just going to skip that bit here, right? I'm going to skip this. Okay, you can't, this is things that you already know. Um, but you can apply image recognition to other kinds of pattern recognition, right? So PET scans, helping to predict Alzheimer's, helping to predict Alzheimer's, not based on images, but based on your speech. So um, it, now AI can actually predict if you're gonna get uh, dementia based on uh, the number of repetition of words or word finding issue you have or pauses you have now. And so image recognition is one thing, right? Diagnosis of, of, of conditions, you know, we know Babylon you know, and the systematic review showing that it's just as good as GPs now, AI and, and pediatricians are kind of skipped those studies. In, in, in psychiatry, they can pick now, AI can help pick depression in, in uh, conversations uh, on, based on your voice, PTSD, based on the speech, potentially whether you're going to get psychosis. Um, and then suicide. This is the kind of holy grail, right? And this is part of some of the research that I've done myself. Um, in 2016, there was a big review looking at 50 years of psychological research in suicide. And it concluded that despite all the um, research that we have done in suicide, um, human beings are no better than chance in predicting if someone's going to commit suicide. And you kind of understand this because, um, and as a psychiatrist, if I see a patient, a patient comes to me and I ask him, are you suicidal? The patient tells me, no, I'm not suicidal. Or the patient tells me, yes, I'm suicidal. Just based on that, that's not very predictive because the patient could change their mind the next day because something bad could have happened, the illness could get worse. And so it's, it's no better than flipping the coin, better I can say that person's gonna kill themselves tomorrow in a, or in a week, right? That's, <laughs> that's the level of research and, uh, and evidence we have in psychology. Having, now, that, a year after that um, systematic review was, was published, there was this study that came out that showed that actually in this study, an AI was given uh, patients, patients' health records, not even interviewing the patient. It doesn't, doesn't matter about what the patient tells you. Based on the health record review, it was able to predict with 80 to 90% accuracy whether someone was going to commit suicide the next two years or 92% if someone's going to commit suicide the next week, just based on the history. So whether the person had history of depression, how the person was feeling over time, all the other risk factors. So, um, and, and in this study, which is again, um, around the same time, very, very interesting, combining machine learning and, and uh, functional MRI. So where the person's awake, you do the MRI, different parts of the um, um, uh, brain lights up depending on what you're thinking. And if you get a person to say six words, death, cruelty, trouble, carefree, good, praise, depending on which part of the brain lights up as you say those words, because it's impacting in a different way, 
the machine learning algorithm could predict if you were going to be suicidal in the 91% accuracy. Now, I'm going to just say at this point, a lot of these studies are experimental. They're done in, under experimental conditions. And, you know, there's a lot of issues with AI research because of the way it's set up, right? But, you know, but we, we know that a lot of social media companies are now using AI to look at the posts and to refer people to, um, to uh, help. Right, and so in 2016, uh, doctors were still beating AI in terms of simple diagnostic uh, apps. But since then, as I was saying, AI can diagnose childhood diseases better than uh, junior doctors, just as good as senior pediatricians. This is a Nature Medicine study recently, and then a few systematic reviews have found that it is actually on par with clinicians now, right? In terms of diagnosis, okay, this is this is this is the AI Babylon study. Um, so I'm just giving the background because this is important to, to, to share before then we go into the ethical and medical legal implications of what I'm sharing with you. So there will be surgeons, if there are surgeons online saying, okay, that's fine. I'm talking about psychiatrists, talking about physicians, they are using the brain, you know, just like the um, barber surgeons in the past, surgeons now are saying, I can do things that physicians can't do. I can cut, I can use my hands. AI cannot do that, right? Currently, Da Vinci robots and things are not automated. You still need a human being behind driving it. So this study was out of China. Uh, first of all, a robot dentist was able to put in implants a few years ago by, by itself. But that's one thing. What about other things, right? So I'm going to show you, um, in 2016, um, this MIT has a what they call the Smart Tissue Autonomous Robot Star. It was uh, compared to humans in terms of um, suturing, stitching, it was just as good, if not better than a human in stitching. Okay, very simple stuff, stitching. A year later, it was able to beat um, human beings uh, uh, in cutting, making more precise cutting. And then um, this is a study that came out just this year. Um, the, the star, this is the same robot, okay? <laughs> uh, they've continued to improve it. Star was able to from keyhole surgery in pigs and anastomas connect two parts of the bowel together and stitch it together, uh, just as good as a, as a well, significantly better than a human is what they're saying, right? And that's, that's remarkable, okay? So, and this is autonomous surgery. This is not with a human being doing it. So um, robots are now getting to the point where they potentially could stitch better, cut better, and join bowels better than a human being. And you know, I think this is very early days, okay? So I'm not saying that robots are gonna replace surgeons. So surgeons' jobs are safe, safer than pathologists and radiologists, but we'll see, it's, it's an evolving space. So what's, what, what does this all mean? Uh, okay, I'm now trying to move my slide forward. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, what are the implications? So AI is obviously very good at prediction now, right? We kind of know this. Uh, image recognition and a prediction. But with prediction, what happens if we use AI to predict things that are, that are not necessary to predict? So in this case, this, this, uh, this research is based on two couples, based on a couple speaking, they could predict if the couple was gonna be divorced or not. Okay, just based on the number of we, you, I words and the way they speak, were able to predict whether their marriage was going to be successful or not. So that's one way of doing it, interesting. But then this, this is a controversial study that some of you may know of, where the researchers took pictures from dating apps of individuals, and they, they could, the AI could tell if they were gay just on the face. Just on the face, not on the clothes, just not on the bio, just on the face. Now, controversial, because there were two studies based on this research. There were lots of people then publishing counter studies saying this is impossible. But, you know, again, um, using AI for interesting purposes. So, and this leads us then to the implications of research uh, on, on insurance. So, um, uh, AI can help insurers, comp insurance companies better fraud because if someone's saying, I can't, my back's out, I can't work, and AI could go and search social media and say, well, actually, that's a picture of you having a holiday. No, right? But, but the same AI could be used against you, right? 
because um, it could try to take away your insurance by um, looking at your prediction. So if you have access to your genome, access to your social media, you could say, actually, you're at a high risk of certain diseases, we're going to remove your insurance. So again, um, the privacy of that data, of your health information, uh, is at risk if um, certain companies can use it to try to predict your risk to them, uh, which then leads us to the issue of privacy. Um, as we get more and more growth, there's more and more data around yourself, which is good, because <clears throat> you can use it to be able to know how your health was uh, in the past, how your health is now in real time, and predict how your health is going to be into the future. That's fantastic. But the issue with this is that um, private, so, you know, Google DeepMind, IBM Watson, there's a lot of case studies of um, AI companies falling foul of privacy laws around the world. In fact, now with um, listening devices, you might, people online probably know this, um, you know, your phone, uh, smart speakers are listening to you all the time because it has to. And in fact, it's constantly recording all the time. And um, there was this um, case in the US where police was able to subpoena Amazon to get access to the recording to find out how someone was murdered in a house. Because um, the, the, um, the Alexa device recorded the murder because it's recording all the time. And it's, by the way, it's recording all the time and stored, okay? Somewhere, and potentially police could actually have access to it. And so I would suggest you don't have a smart speaker in your bedroom or anywhere else where you do not want it to record confidential noises and conversations. <laughs> it's what I would say, right? Okay, so privacy is really, and I mean, I, I, I skip over the Elon Musk neural link, um, but you know, there are lots of uh, research, not just Elon Musk, but in Australia even, brain computer interfacing is already happening um, to kind of uh, help people see, help people hear, uh, decipher thoughts, um, help to help people who are paralyzed to speak. But this direct brain to brain kind of communication, whether it's direct or whether it's your EEG, like that scientific report study was around, was an EEG to try to get people to kind of collaborate using EEG, means that in the future, instead of um, us typing our, on our phones to communicate and then reading potentially, and Facebook and other companies are working on this, we could communicate with our phones directly. And if that is two way, so not only are we sending uh, information to the phone to, to send a message out instead of using our voice. It could be sending information back to us. Our thoughts could be potentially uh, be at risk because then the phone's potentially reading our thoughts. And reading our thoughts is one thing, but sending us thoughts is the other. They're already trying to nudge us using um, apps, uh, using ads and things, you know, suggesting to us when we search, maybe you're looking for this based on our, our speech. Imagine if you could nudge just using our thoughts. Uh, uh, and then you can imagine not just co commercial companies trying to do this, but political parties trying to influence you to vote for them or nudge, them, nudge your thinking towards one way or the other. So again, this is another whole kind of ethical issue around how do we um, as a society govern the use of direct mind technology? Now, uh, you know, the, the, some countries are now using uh, surveillance uh, full scale to try to pick people who are uh, shoplifting, for example, who predict you from the gate. They can tell who you are just from the way you are. But in China, I mean, this is not, nothing new. People online know there is a social credit system now in China uh, where uh, depending on whether you are following the law or breaking the law, your social credit, it's kind of like a credit score that a lot of countries use for you, uh, you know, when you want to apply for a bank loan, your credit score is good, you get a loan, if not, you don't. But this is, this is across all aspects of your life, right? That's an example of a Chinese actress whose social, she couldn't get into a, a club because the social credit score had come down and she was in, why? Because her face was on the side of a bus, because she's an actress, she was used on an ad, and the bus was driving around and she was being pinged for jaywalking. Um, <laughs> constantly being pinged for jaywalking because her face was being recognized someone just crossing the road without you know, waiting for the green light. And um, so there are kind of side effects of this, but it uh, it's just leads us to, you know, once we start using AI to kind of try to govern society, we can use it to predict crime, right? And this is already happening in the US. Um, there are companies like PrepPol, uh, where they, instead of having police everywhere, 
this company uh, looks at the data, um, crime data, population data, and then tells the police, uh, the uh, state department of police, this is where you need to have more police. The problem with that, obviously, as we all know, is the potential of bias, right? Because if there are more crime in one setting because of the population data, it might be because there are more uh, minorities people or lower socioeconomic people living in that. And if you link the two, even though there not be a causation, uh, you're going to have this uh, vicious cycle where police are going to be hard on minority groups and people who are poorer, leading to more potential more crime. And so that's exactly what's happened in the US and it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. Impersonation is the other issue when it comes to AI, right? It's very low volume. I mean, the point here is that that's not Obama speaking, it's Jordan Peele. And it's deepfake AI, right? Deepfake's already being used, okay? Um, it's used in movies. It's, uh, it's, uh, people have shown it. It's used in um, pornography now. People putting other people's faces on pornography. And that's uh, a huge use case. But, you know, obviously it is an issue when you cannot trust what you're watching because deepfake AI is actually so good now that it uh, takes another AI to pick them. So there is now um, adversarial AI systems where, you know, and that's how AI actually learns to be even better is where you can't pick it. So you got to have a set AI to try to pick that that's fake. And then that the AI learns how to be more fake. And then you have that um, competition arms race. And then it's just this liability. This is where, um, this, this is the obvious thing. When AI is actually smart enough to start diagnosing people, right? Uh, who is at fault if the AI gets it wrong? Right? So the issue of liability is a real one, right? And uh, this, this whole area is still an emerging uh, space in law. There, there's no real case law here. There hasn't, no one has actually, no, no one has actually brought an AI case to court as yet in, in health specifically, um, because ultimately in health, a doctor is still involved. There's still a human being involved. The AI system now built into a lot of EMR programs provide clinical decision support based on the evidence and will generate a recommendation. Still a doctor deciding, yes, I'm going to follow the advice of the AI or no, I'm not. Are you going to suggest this medication? Yes, but maybe I'm not going to, right? So, uh, but it is a real issue. Now, this whole issue of, because AI, AI is not a real thing, right? AI, AI is a software, right? Uh, it's, it's an algorithm. So who's at fault then? Is it the, the clinician involved? Is it the hospital who hires the clinician on bot system? Is it the vendor? Is it the software programmer? Um, uh, or is it the AI? Because is the AI smart enough to stand alone? Yeah, the EU actually got so far to consider giving AI entities, uh, legal entity uh, personhood, just like a comp company. You know how companies now, you can sue companies. Companies as a board of director, but it stands alone has a legal entity and they were going to do the same thing with AI and you know, have a people behind the AI, but the AI, you can sue an AI. They actually stopped doing it. They still held step back and, but it's still something on the agenda of the EU to consider. So they have, um, the, 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 there is a case recently where someone uh, used an AI system to, uh, to uh, invest in the stock market and they lost a lot of money and they, they uh, sue the AI and suit the company. Um, and, and that case uh, was kind of like first case, test case around whether AI can be sued. And, and obviously AI can't be sued. Obviously the company had to be, had to come into place. But I think this is an emerging area. Uh, IP is another one. So IP is interesting because um, if AI gets to a point where it starts generating new intellectual property, who owns the intellectual property? So this is a real case in the US that went all the way to the patent's office in the US, some of you might know about it, where this scientist developed an AI system, sent the AI system into the internet to say, look for problems and come up with solutions. And the AI independently came up with two solutions for two problems uh, for device, I can't remember exactly what it is, of simple devices, which the scientist said, I'm gonna want to patent it, but because the scientists had nothing to do with it, did not design and invent those two devices, said the AI should own the, the patent should own the IP. This went to the patent office in the US, went to court. 
And in the end, it was found, no, AI cannot own IP. And that's the state at the moment. AI cannot own IP, it has to be a person. So the scientists have to own the IP. Even though the scientists didn't come up with it, he only came up with the AI, all right? So who owns, so that is an open question at the moment. Can an AI system be given a patent? At the moment, the answer is no, but it is an open question at the moment. The, the last thing I'm gonna cover is, and, you, and this, you're all experts, you know this, there's this black box. When it comes to neural networks, deep learning, um, you know, we need to kind of figure out what is in the black box because if you can't trust AI, if you don't know how it's come up with the, with the decision, you're gonna get problems like, like you know, RoboDebt in, in, in Australia is one, but then, you know, they did this, before RoboDebt happened in Australia, they did this in the UK, it was a disaster there too, where AI made decisions around social services and payment of um, uh, social services payments. But, and, and because it, 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 we all know with machine learning, the AI kind of learns over time. This is how you make a decision. But it started making decisions where a human being is going, why did you decide not to pay this person? Or why did you decide that this person owed money? And if, when it, they come, they came, the human beings couldn't really know because the AI just kind of decided. <laughs> it just knew. You can, you know? And so, this, that, that, and because of this recent disaster, there's a lack of trust in AI. Because the AI can actually learn to be biased based on um, and how it learns, right? We all know this, right? This is, this is common sense. Oh, yeah, I can be racist and sexist as a science article, and they release an AI onto the internet to learn how to be a human being. It became like a human being, racist and sexist. And then you know, MIT is kind of done this experiment where they send an AI to the worst part of the internet, you know, uh, the dark web, Reddit sub, sub, subreddits that were really bad, and the AI became quite bad. And so the, the, um, the, the issue of teaching AI ethics you know, it's, it's a real issue. And it's a real issue because in health, human beings kind of make those decisions all the time, right? A doctor kind of has to decide, do I admit, uh, you know, during COVID, COVID pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, do I admit this person or this person? It is an ethical dilemma because both deserve to live, but you can't admit one person. So you kind of think about all sorts of, uh, you know, intensive care physicians have algorithms in their head. Could you send it to an AI? And the AI, you know, trolley problem, right? You know, it's, it's the obvious problem uh, that you're gonna think about. Now in AI, in AI, the obvious practical application of this is self-driving cars. This, should the self-driving car kill the old lady or kill the baby, <laughs> right? How do you program a self-driving car to decide that? That's kind of, and, 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 and the other thing is, should it, if there was gonna be an accident, should the self-driving car kill the pedestrian or kill the driver? Because sometimes you gotta decide. It could hit the pedestrian, save the driver, or go, and kill the driver, or save the pedestrian, right? And some some ethicists have um, recommended creating a, a knob in the car so that you, as a driver, you decide. I'm a selfish driver. I'm going to try to kill myself, or I'm a, or I'm going to. I'd rather you kill the pedestrian, save me, or I'm actually a very selfless driver, save everyone else, kill me, let the driver decide. Anyway, you know, and and artificial intelligence as well, because at the moment we've got artificial narrow intelligence, you know. Uh, People would have, might have heard of um, uh, Nick Bostrom, right? He's, um, he's, uh, he's, he's saying, if you get an AI machine to make paper clips, could the AI, because they, that becomes his focus, decide to make the whole world a paper clip and kill everybody? You know, that was his um, kind of thought experiment. And, and last thing I end is this. At the moment, as I was saying, humans still have liability and still make the final decisions most of the time, right? But now, there is now this, this kind of challenge. In, in warfare, so far, even though drones fly, there's an AI in there and it says, I found a target, it's still a human being pressing the button, but there are now people now saying, actually, that decision should be made by the machine because human beings making those machines means that you lose two or three seconds, right? Why should a human being make the machine? The machine is good enough. So, if we remove a human out of machines killing humans, that's a big step, right? That's why the UN actually has, has concerns around um, automated warfare. It's the same in, and that analogy is the same in, in, in health. If, ro if machines start to do operations by itself and botches it up, who is at fault here? There's no doctor around. It's the machine who's doing it, right? So this issue of liability is a real one and the risk issue of decision making, who makes the final decision, um, who is accountable, right? It is a real issue. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I'm gonna 
finish up. So this is why, you know, there are ethical people working on ethical principles for AI. You know, the College of Radiologists have ethical principles. People who read science fiction know the Asimov's three principles, the law of robotics. Um, but then, you know, there are people who are working on Esseloma, AI principles, uh, EU uh, guidelines. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. I think um, the, the future is interesting because we know quantum computing is coming in, right? And AI is using quantum com computers now. So instead of Siri, you know, uh, current computing, quantum computing, uh, repeating 100 qubits, photonic chips are coming in. So instead of silicon chips running at the speed of electrons in electricity, which is what our brain works on, speed of electrons, this, are, this is the speed of light, all right? And again, AI is moving on to optical photonic chips uh, much faster. You know, we're talking 10,000 faster artificial synapses uh, based on uh, those chips. So we can see that AI is going to expand. So there's no doubt, right? Okay, and your AI research is online. The AI is going to, we're going to, it's going to surpass human capacity at some point. I'm, 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 I think that's true. Probably, you know, the singularity, people know about that. And so it's about how we prepare as a society to catch up around the ethics and more around that, that progress. Stop here because I want to leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to see Michio Kaku. It's Michio Kaku. I don't know if you know him. Uh, okay, let's stop. Oh, yeah. And we've launched an AI council now at St. Vincent's, which I chair, where we are trying to come up with some governance frame uh, principles around how to introduce AI. Uh, we're going to have ethical guidelines and we're going to have an AI registry because there's actually a lot of AI actually in the health system at the moment. Clinicians are introducing AI left, right, and center because vendors approach them, give it to them for free, and they're deploying them sometimes in production. And so I think for us, we need to really come up with a system to make sure that it's safe and that there is a government structure over it. So thank you. I'm going to stop here. Big questions. Think, yeah, there's already been some come through. Um, yes, under the so chat. Yeah. So the first okay. one there. Although the decision will be made by humans according to AI's recommendation, do you think junior doctors might become lazy and rely on AI's decision only? You know what? I think we're going to go to a transition, right? I think we're in a transition where humans are still going to make the final decisions because no one's going to be trusting machines at this point. They'll come at uh, 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 what's the word? A flex uh, point. What's the word? A flexing point or inflection point, right? Where AI is going to be much better than humans. Okay. It, at some point, it's going to say, This person's got this disease. You do not put out, prescribe this drug because I've gone through the whole history of everybody with this, with this condition. This drug's going to make it worse. Prescribe this drug. Everyone's going to believe that. All right. Because that's going to be the center of care. Is a doctor who doesn't follow it might likely going to be sued if something goes wrong, but they're going to follow it because that's just, that's going to be the gold standard, right? And um, and so I think at that point, I think as you say, you know, junior doctors would they be lazy? Um, I, yes, I think some of them will be lazy and just follow whatever recommendation. But I think at some point, even the senior doctors are going to follow it because AI is going to remove. You know, this is what Eric Topol writes in Deep Medicine in his book. AI is going to remove the kind of data intensive part of medicine, the need to look at the latest literature, the need to look at the health records and the pathology results and the radiology results to kind of consolidate that. AI is going to just come up and tell you, okay, which is already happening to a certain degree. It's going to tell you this is what this person's got, okay, based on this. This is the probability of 97.5%. And you're going to be crazy not to, not to believe that. So your job there as a doctor becomes less about the formulation of the diagnosis and the you know, differential diagnosis and the treatment, you'd be more talking to the patient, reassuring them and being a doctor as a more as a caring person because machines can't do that part of it. So you'll be able to do that. So I think that is, uh, yeah. So the next, do we keep going? Yeah, yeah. The next question kind of relates then, I suppose. <laughs> Um, mm. so do you, I'll read it in case anyone hasn't seen it, but do you think AI eventually will grow empathy for human beings? To, I'll go into empathy. Well, 
It's a great question. It's a great question around whether empathy evolves as part of natural evolution as an adaptive thing for a species like uh, like us to be able to survive uh, as a out of natural selection and whether that can be because you know we has, has a group of you know human beings together empathy helps us survive because we have empathy we can feel pain for, so that we don't kind of kill one another you know although we still do that but you know for a healthy society we have empathy. whether a created sentient artificial intelligent being needs empathy do you know what i mean to to compete uh it, you could program empathy you could artificially build it in but i don't know if it, it will naturally emerge out of intelligence because you remember human beings we're not just a brain we are our body we are our hormones we've got all sorts of uh evolutionary pressures to develop the way we have right? machines are just machines okay so I, I that is a philosophical question which is interesting because you could you could program empathy there's no question about it but it will be fake right um and whether that makes a difference or maybe it doesn't make a difference maybe fake empathy is still empathy. if you can't tell who cares right because there are doctors around walking around with fake empathy they have no empathy for the patients but they develop a way of communicating with patients that demonstrates empathy so that they can care for them and get the patient better but they may have not have any real empathy, to be honest. Um, uh, and whether that's the same, right? So did you want to keep going with the question? I'll let you, because there are questions in both the Q&A and the chat. I'll let you. Yeah. Kind of I'll, go to the, I'll go to the Q&A, because um, I think the one in the chat was just, are you able to share your slides? It wasn't. Um, yeah, happy to. No worries. Um, and I thought we had, that's right. Although I've got here, although the deceit, oh no, I've said that one. Um, one of the examples, one of the examples is that doctors mm -hmm. are most relying on imaging outcomes only without regular clinical exams and sometimes makes wrong decisions. Correct. So that's right. You can't take a single data point in isolation. You need all the data points. And that's why currently, you know, in radiology and pathology, AIs use as supplementary to the doctor who then is able to kind of collect that information. And even to be to be frank, even the radiologist only has one part of the data point. You need to triangulate that, right? Radiologists only have the radiology, pathology only has pathologists only have the pathology. A cardiologist usually only has the heart. You need you need a GP or someone else to have to bring it all together. Okay. And ultimately once we have our proper EMRs and health systems that are linked nationally, everything's all linked. AI would be able, should should be able to bring it together in a more coherent way uh, without the uh, potential for errors and things being missed. Because at the moment, all you all you, you need is miss an X-ray report or a biopsy report for for a few weeks or months, and someone's cancer gets out of hand. And so you know, I think I think that's right. So that is a good point that you can't just take imaging. Uh, no matter how good an AI is, it can only pat, recognize the pattern. This person probably has. Uh, lung cancer, but maybe the person's got something else because of a history of something else that you know, we don't know, right? What's the perspective of artificial evolution? I have a long one. Okay, from go. Um, go. You can scroll, it's in the chat. Um, yeah. So FDA has been extremely strict for any autonomous AI products. Yeah. IDX took five years to have a, approval. Um, and then, do you know any autonomous AI products and have they been approved by TGA? Um, has TGA established any guidelines for regulatory approval for autonomous AI products or even AI based have. decision products? So, the answer is that they have. So, I think weeks ago, following the FDA, the TGA in Australia came up with guidelines to regulate AI. Um, software has a device, they're treating it like a device, basically. They call it software as a device. And I'm not aware, I know in the US, the FDA has approved, um, you know, ret, ret, uh, retinal AI apps. They've got uh, a couple of um, blood pressure AI apps. In Australia, they are basically saying, as far as I understand, 
you can use AI apps in the health system if the AI is not replacing a clinician's clinical judgment or uh, intervention. So for example, it, there are plenty of AI apps now that are being used to predict length of stay, to, to um, try to predict uh, uh, things, right? That's the fine line between that and predict and triaging patients and then you uh, using, replacing doctor's clinical judgment. It's a fine line. They're saying if it replaces a doctor or a nurse or a clinician's clinical judgment, it needs to, you need to apply for TGA approval for the AI. It becomes a clinical AI. Um, I, I think there's a lot of gray. They have, they have, do have guidelines. They've published them recently. They do have guidelines, but there's a lot of gray still. And I'm not sure that anything has actually been approved yet. I'm not aware. Still very new and still very new in Australia, and uh, yeah, uh, at the moment. And I think just adding to that, um, so part of that being has been improved. Um, who should take the lead to educate or initiate this kind of discussion with TGA? Or do you think the discussion should be had? Well, I think um, it's good like like this. It's um, there are. Uh, uh, national groups. I know Macquarie University, AIHI, they've got an AI group that they set up to try to come up with national guidelines. The specialty colleges have got together. So the College of Radiologists have come up with guidelines where all the other specialty colleges have provided input on. Um, I think it's very much an emerging, emerging space, really. There's no clear leadership group taking the lead here. I think the TJs, just, they have their own experts. Um, um, but yeah, no, I think it, it deserves to have a lot more um, focus, I think, because uh, the, the fact of the matter is there's so many products out, so many vendors in the space now, and uh, it's, it, it's very, it will very easily be taken out of our hands if you don't kind of get ahead of it. Yeah. Um. Was there another one? I think there was one more in the Q and A. Um, what's the perspective of artificial evolution? It's a fascinating, um, fascinating question. Look at there are two levels to this. One within the AI itself. So Google is doing a lot of research on this actually, um, and you can read up on it. Where they've um, taken AI, they've let AI naturally learn, and the AI actually evolves. Uh, its um, experience of reality, just like a human being, it learns how to touch, it learns how to, what's hot, what's soft, what's, what's hot, what's cold, it just learns and, and learns speech the same way. So it's, it's interesting that by, in and of itself, if you just create a convoluted neural network and you model it like a human brain, which is complex networks, uh, that thing could learn like a human. So it's one thing because we're evolving like a human being and learning. And they've taken it quite far, um, Google. Um, I think they publish quite a lot of it, but I think a lot of it's not published. Um, and, then, um, and then you talk about AI in general. I think people have written about this, right? So, you know, more, more in the sci-fi area, but there's a huge overlap with physicists and, and people have written about. Um, there is this um, uh, uh, belief that machine intelligence is probably the next evolution of intelligence that Whenever there's biological intelligence, there will come machine intelligence. And machine intelligence will just replace biological intelligence because it's just more efficient, it's immortal, it thinks faster. In fact, it, it's, you know, if you think about how we are thinking, right? It's very slow. I'm telling, I'm talking to you through a screen, through sound, uh, in, 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 in using words that you've got to interpret and understand using image. And AI, you know, machines can just bypass all that because it's past, you know, straight away download the information, you've got it, right? So think about how much quicker they think and how much quicker they'll solve problems for themselves. So once they get to that point, you know, the, so people will believe that actually the intelligence that we'll meet are not aliens that are biological. Most likely aliens out there are actually machines. Most likely, because they, they will, and in fact, they will be not, they, most likely they won't be meeting us. We will be, they'll be meeting our machines. We'll send machines out because machines can fly faster they don't have to eat or drink. They can be smart and just represent us, right? You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, that's probably 
moving into the sci-fi kind of futuristic theoretical discussion, but it's interesting to think about. Um, okay, what else? I think that I think there might have just been wait on was there one more? Um, are there any insurance companies you think that would launch medical indemnity or malpractice insurance I, AI? Products? They don't exist today, but I reckon in future that they want to um, think about because I think in future there'll come a time when we will have to think about how AI will need legal protection and legal personhood once they start, you know, behaving independently and thinking for themselves. Uh, you need to think about that. And I think, um, but for the moment, AI is just treated like any other software. And we have liability, you know, we have liability insurance for, for that. And it'll be treated like that, I think, um, because it's not that sophisticated yet. But there'll come a time when we have to think about <laughs> what it means, uh, you know, whether it, you, you, it does need its own insurance because it, it'll be, you'll be able to be sued by itself. Mm. Well, I oh, wait on. There's one more. I was about to say, I think you got through them all, but... Good. Oh, yeah, you did. That was just a thank you. <laughs> perfect, perfect timing. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think um, since you did get through the questions, um, thank you so much for um, speaking tonight and answering all the questions. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I was very... Um... Oh, Jane. Jane's here. Jane Copeland. <laughs> Hello, Jane from my team. Oh, it's Adele. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> and yeah, thank you everyone for joining in as well. All right. All right. Yeah, All right. take care. Bye. Right. Bye.